Second Sunday in Advent already, hard to believe that we're that fast and far into the season. This morning's scripture comes from Matthew's Gospel, and this is chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until after she had born a son. And he named him Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel. What is up with the name Emmanuel? You know, this is Advent season. This is the season where we anticipate the birth of Jesus, and yet we sing songs about Emmanuel. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. Who is this Emmanuel person? Uh, you know, I, because what I read in the scripture says his name is Jesus. You know, the angel said, uh, you will name him Jesus, and that's exactly what he does. Had no marital relations with her until she had born a son and named him Jesus. Nowhere in the rest of the pages of the Gospels, nor the letters, nor the Apocalypse, nor anything afterwards, do we get any more mention of this fellow Emmanuel nor the name Emmanuel, and yet Christmas songs are full of Emmanuels. You know, Hark the Herald Angels sings of Jesus our Emmanuel. Uh, the choir anthem this morning was one, it was a song about Emmanuel. What is this Emmanuel? Am I the only one confused about this? What is, you know, why is this? To get another mention of Emmanuel, you got to go all the way back to Isaiah, and it's an old, old story about King Ahaz, and it's a long and uh, very detailed story, and it's got a, you know, a lot of great political things going on in it, and, and uh, it, you know, it can be a little bit tedious, so I'll give you the shortest version of the Ahaz story that I can give you, and that is this, that uh, at the time of King Ahaz, the, the land that God had brought the people into, what we think of as the nation of Israel, uh, it was actually in two kingdoms. Uh, after Solomon's death, uh, that land had uh, split after a civil war into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom, which went by the name Israel, and the southern kingdom, which went by the name Judah. The southern kingdom is where Jerusalem is, it's where Bethlehem is, uh, those, the Dead Sea, those places are in the southern kingdom in Judah. The northern kingdom, that's where Galilee is, Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, all those, Nazareth, all that stuff is in what would be called Israel. Together, they make up the entire area of where God brought the people in. At the time of Ahaz, uh, Ahaz is the king of the southern, which is known as Judah. In the north, there's Israel, and then just to the north of them is another kingdom known as Aram. So Judah, Israel, Aram. And just to the west of Aram is a little tiny slice of Phoenicia and the Mediterranean Sea. On the other side, you got a desert, and the Fertile Crescent comes around like this. Okay? The Assyrians are the conquering empire of the time, and they are just marching through the cre Fertile Crescent, conquering, 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 conquering. And anybody who's watching what's going on can see that before long, the Assyrians are going to be on the doorstep of Aram, and then they're going to be on the doorstep of Israel, and then they're going to be on the doorstep of Judah. 
And so the king of Israel and the king of Aram decided we need to form an alliance with Judah. And between the three of us, maybe we will be strong enough to uh, stand up to the Assyrians because we know they're coming. So they went to Ahaz and said, hey, we want to form an alliance with you against the Assyrians. And Ahaz wasn't so sure about that. That probably the last thing that he wants to do is be in an alliance with uh, a couple nations and fight against the Assyrians. Because if they don't win, you know, it's not going to go well for Judah either. And, uh, you know, they could strike a deal with uh, the Assyrians, uh, but then again, that's going to severely limit their own sovereignty, or they can stand alone against the Assyrians. Again, not a good option. King Ahaz has no good options in front of him. It's pretty hopeless. And uh, so he tells the, um, the king of Israel and the king of Aram, I'm sorry, I'm not going to join your alliance. Well, they get pretty angry about that. And they decide they're going to invade Judah. And when King Ahaz hears that Israel and Aram, instead of you know, fighting the Assyrians, are going to turn around and, and uh, you know, come after him, he's pretty afraid. It says, The heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. So the whole King Ahaz and the whole nation, they're shaking like leaves on trees, knowing that the, uh, Israel and Aram is going to invade them. And so God sends the prophet Isaiah to Ahaz and gives him these words, words that sound not like Jesus. Do not fear. Do not let your hearts be faint because of these two smoldering stumps, which would be those two nations. Do not fear. Do not let your hearts be faint. You know, it sounds a lot like the words that Jesus said to his disciples and, uh, when he was about to leave them. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. Believe in God. Believe also in me. So that's, uh, that's the message. Don't be afraid. That Aram is not going to stand. And Israel is not going to stand against you. That's not going to happen. Now, you don't have to be a great military strategist to, to figure that out. And you know, the last thing anybody wants to do is if you're Aram in Israel and you've got the Assyrians on your northern border and they're coming around on your eastern border as they conquer Phoenicia and you've got a desert on this border, and, you, and the last thing you want to do is open up another fight on your southern border. You know, that's just not good strategy. God tells Isaiah to say to Ahaz, he says, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. You know, ask God for a sign so that you can stop worrying about Israel and Iran. Whatever it is, you pick the sign and whatever it is, God will make that happen. And uh, King Ahaz says, well, I would never put God to the test in that way. And so Isaiah says, well, fine, then. This will be your sign. Okay? And then we get these famous words. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son. And you shall name him, or, and he shall, his name shall be Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. So the message is, the sign is going to be, there's going to be a woman and she's going to have a child and the child is going to be named Emmanuel. And before that child is weaned, you know, this business about eating curds and the honey and all that kind of stuff, all that means is before this child is um, on solid food. You know, I don't know why these prophets write in such strange language, but, you know. And this business about before he's able to choose the good and choose the evil and all this kind of thing, all that means is, you know, before this child is two years old, this child, the, the two nations that you're worried about, God will have dealt with them. And that's exactly what happens. 
the Assyrians come through, and they conquer Aram, and then they conquer Israel, and they take those people off into Assyrian captivity, and Judah is spared for now. Later on, the Babylonians will come through and will conquer them and take them off into exile. But for now, we're dealing with the Assyrians. And uh, the Assyrians do come through, and they deal with those two kingdoms. And Judah is spared. And there's a lot more details in this story, uh, you know, a lot more stuff about how the Assyrians came in like a flood and they were up to their necks and, you know, Assyrians and all this kind of stuff. But all of that comes to an end with, with these words. It says, take counsel together, but it shall be brought to naught. So it basically says, you know, you nations, you can, you know, form alliances, do whatever you want to do, but it ain't going to come to anything. Speak a word, but it will not stand. So say whatever you want. It ain't going to come to anything. Plan, scheme, talk, all you want to do. It ain't going to amount to a hill of beans. For God is with us. In the time of great trouble, in a time of uncertainty, of the uncertain future, at a time when it was difficult to know what to do, no good options, everything in front of them is an impossibility. The sign is a child will be born and will be called Emmanuel. Take counsel together, say whatever you will. It's not going to come to anything but because of the sign, Emmanuel, God is with us. Now, Joseph, so I guess we should back up. So that was way back then, in the time of King Ahaz and Isaiah the prophet, the sign God is with us that is shown by this child, Emmanuel, who will be, um, you know, by the time he's two, everything will be dealt with. Joseph, he stands alone, and he doesn't have any good options in front of him. He's got this woman, Mary who, he's in, Mary, who he's engaged to be married to. And in those days, in that culture, the engagement was an entire year. And during that entire year, they were not together, that, they, that she stayed in her father's house, and uh, the man was to stay in his house, and there was to be no hanky-panky in between them. And for that entire time, nor were they supposed to, uh, you know, have any of that sort of behavior with anybody else. And that entire year, uh, consider it a, uh, a, a proving period or a guarantee that nothing inappropriate had happened because no one is showing any signs of pregnancy. You know, you've got a whole year to, to keep an eye out on this kind of thing. The worst thing that can happen for Mary is that she becomes pregnant during this period. And for her, and in that time, that means the worst for her. And that she is rendered then unmarriable. And also would bring disgrace upon her family so she wouldn't have a home in her, in her own family. Uh, nor is she able to have a home with anyone else in the community. And, and her options are severely limited. And she is vulnerable to uh, very much the worst that life has to offer. And in the most extreme case, they could take her outside of the town and stone her to death, and they would have the full endorsement of Scripture to do that. Joseph, he's got his own set of problems, too, that if Joseph marries her, that is the same as admitting guilt that he is the one who has been uh, behaving inappropriately with Mary during this engagement period, and that will bring its own set of social and economic consequences. So the future for both of these two is bleak. And this isn't just a story. I mean, these are real-life consequences for um, you know, something that looks pretty desperate. No good choices for Joseph. It's like Judah. Didn't have any good options in front of them. And in the midst of no good options, the answer to the impossible is the sign. Emmanuel. God is with us. That's the message that the angel brings. Remember that sign way back then, Joseph? When everything seemed so impossible, 
today. It seems impossible for you. But the sign is now for you too. Emmanuel, God is with you. Don't be afraid. That was the message to Ahab. Ahaz, don't be afraid. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be afraid. Believe in God. Believe also in me. God is with the two of you, and the child that is conceived within her is of the Holy Spirit. The sign that God gave to rescue the people is the same one that is given to Joseph to reassure him that God is in what is going on. And the God who is in what is happening and the sign that God gives to Joseph, the Emmanuel, which means God is with us, that sign is no longer Emmanuel. The sign literally becomes God with us. And so what was used in the past as a sign to show that God was with them actually takes on flesh and becomes God with them in Jesus. That's what we talk about when we talk about the incarnation of Jesus. It is no longer just the sign, but it is the, the, the metaphysical and the experiential reality of God as one with us. No longer is it just a sign to reassure people in difficult times, but the sign is now literally God with us. In the full humanity and in the full divinity that we experience in Jesus Christ. Judah needed to be saved from its situation, and Joseph needed to be saved from his situation. And each of us finds ourselves in a no-win situation, that each of us need to be saved from that, and that is that situation, the condition of sin in the world that has affected everything that we are powerless to save ourselves from, that we rely on a Savior, God with us in Jesus to overcome that sin that infects everything in the world. Matthew speaks of the sign as Emmanuel, God with us. John uses very different language. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. And what has come into being in him was life, and that life was the light of all people. So in the beginning, the word was with God. It was an essential piece in creation, that the word Jesus is part of creation, And then skipping down, it says, And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. So the Word was with God. And then here, the Word takes on flesh and is with us. You know, those words from Isaiah, you know, speak a word and it will not stand. This is a completely different... um, Understanding of the word, you know, we, 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 can, we can talk about things and we can plan and we can scheme things, but the word becomes flesh and lives among us. Hmm. The one who was essential to creation is the one who redeems creation. And he does so by joining with it. That the Word becomes flesh, and it is uh, initially uh, God distant from us, and now it is God actually with us. Emmanuel, God with us, is the Word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. Back then it was a sign. After the incarnation, it is no longer a sign. It is literally God with us. And so, there is no more need through the rest of the pages, to talk about the sign. Because the sign now is Jesus. And so we don't hear about Emmanuel through the rest of the scriptures. 
Because then it was a sign. Now it's God in Jesus actually physically with us. So there you go. This business about Emmanuel and Jesus and why we sing these songs about Emmanuel. And um, so what? You know, big deal. We're still going to sing the songs. Um, you know, we still like those songs, and those songs still hold a lot of meaning. What is this? You know, you just spent 15 minutes, Mike, uh, you know, rubbing the skin off of a detail. Um, what does this do for us on Monday morning when we go to face the world? I believe that it means this. I believe that it means that God is not distant and that God is not impersonal and that God is not unconcerned, but our God of creation is a God who loves us and a God who cares about us and a God who suffers with us and is experientially one with us and physically one with us and metaphysically one with us. When we think about the sign of Emmanuel, God becoming flesh and dwelling among us, uh, you know, that's the assurance of us that God cares about each one of us and that God redeems each one of us through the great personal suffering of Jesus Christ. And when we look at the life of Jesus, we see the very nature and the very character of God. That is, we see God or Jesus healing people. And we see God, Jesus comforting and, uh, and confronting the powers of oppression. And we see Jesus valuing the people that the world says, you're nobody. The ones that the world pushes to the margins. Those are the ones who Jesus brings to the center and lifts up and values. We see Jesus teaching. We see Jesus demonstrating compassion. All of these things point us to the very nature of God who is merciful and just, and who saves us. It's a God who deeply cares about each one of us, so much so that God would be willing to suffer God's own self and give God's own life for each one of us. What does it mean? It means this. God cares about us, each one. And so when we sing songs about Emmanuel, yes, it's a song about the sign that God cares for us. But when we come on Christmas Eve and we come to light the candles and hold them up and sing Silent Night and hear the story again and, and hear about the, uh, the angels and the shepherds and all those things, that all those things are symbols and signs that point us to the one, the one. Jesus, who was born to save each one of us from our sins. God's perfect plan with us to dwell. Jesus, the sign, Emmanuel. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let the church say, amen.